Long before computers were powerful enough to allow us to record direct to disc, we had to record onto thin pieces of flexible tape coated in oxides of metal. And when I started recording, I was recording on things like this. Can you name the rock star who recorded a best-selling album on these? In my last video, I talked about the evolution of recording music on computers as it affected me. Well, going back a little bit further than I was in that video, one of the first pieces of recording equipment I ever had, in fact, probably the first piece of recording equipment I ever had, was a Tascam 144 Porter Studio. In fact, they didn't even call it a Tascam Porter Studio back in the day. It was a TIAC Porter Studio. They called them Tascam Porter Studios from the second series, which was the Tascam 244. But the concept was the same. Instead of recording on a cassette tape, in stereo going one way, turn it over and then record in stereo going the other, what you used were the four tracks on the tape all headed in one direction. Simple four track recording but using the cassette format. They ran the tapes at double speed to get a better recording quality and the idea was revolutionary and it was really the beginning of the home recording explosion. Up to then people had had to overdub using reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders. One of the first people to take advantage of this was Bruce Springsteen, who recorded his Nebraska album entirely on a TIAC 144 Porter Studio. Bruce managed to record an album on his, mine never managed to record a single song. It was inherently unreliable and it was a terrible piece of kit. It spent more time in the repair shop than it did in my house. So eventually I traded it in. The retailer got fed up with me taking it back for repairs yet again and I bought an MC202. I decided tape wasn't for me, I was gonna go electronic. What I had to go with it was a Moog Rogue. They actually say that Moog called the little synthesizer they produced back in the day the Rogue purely because they got fed up with people talking about the Mini Moog. It was the Mini Moog and it's the Moog Rogue sort of trips off the tongue kind of nicely. Only problem was the MC202 had MIDI but the Rogue was pre-MIDI so I had to use a combination of concocted wires using bits I bought from Tandy or Radio Shack as I believe they're known in the States soldered together on our kitchen table in order to get the two to talk to each other. The MC202 was a hybrid piece of kit. It was a two-track sequencer but one of the tracks addressed its own built-in synthesizer, which was the synthesizer module from Roland's SH-101 synthesizer, a very popular piece of kit back then and a bit retro and vintage now. The other channel you could program to control an external synth and with it I controlled the Rogue. The MC-202 had MIDI and later I added a Roland TR-505 drum machine to my growing collection of miscellaneous kit. Obviously, I needed more than a single input to take all the outputs from this various piece of kit. And so one of my next acquisitions was my first mixer, a Roland BX series eight track mixer. I did have, for my sort of keyboardy parts, played with more than one finger, an ARP quartet. And that was my setup for quite some time. Eventually, I decided it was time to get more into this world of MIDI and I traded in the MC202 for a Roland Juno and the TR505 I kept and I sold the Rogue to fund the purchase of a Yamaha FB01 which was one of the first multi-timbral synths that was affordable an expander module that just sat on my keyboard rack next to the ARP Quartet and that was my setup until I started working with my friend Andrew who became my songwriting partner and as these videos go on, you're going to hear a lot more about Andrew. Andrew was a vocalist, didn't play guitar or keyboards. We worked together to try and write some songs. Our initial recording setup used 
Andrews Fostex X26, which was a later version of a four-track tape recorder, but it had the advantage that it could also record a synchronisation signal. Now I can't remember whether that meant we had to sacrifice a track and work in three track, or whether we still had four tracks and the ability to sync up as well, but it was asking a lot of a small tape machine. By this stage we were working with the Sinclair Spectrum that I talked about in the previous video and using the synchronisation port on the back of the Spectrum to sync it up to the X26. It was all a bit chaotic. As time went on I got rid of the FB01, I replaced it with a TX7 that I'd got at an auction. Now the TX7 was only monotimbral you could only get one sound at once. But by this stage I'd moved over to the Atari 520 with Cubase and Andrew had invested in a U220 sound module which gave us many more sounds and for the time many more modern sounds, better sounds than we were getting out of the FB01. The big step forward came when we went 8-track. Well actually we went 7-track. We got a Fostex R8 and a SEC 18 into 8 into 2 desk. That replaced the little 8-track Roland mixer that I'd had and that we'd been using up to that point. And we synced the two together using a Fostex MTC1, a MIDI time controller. What this did was it took the output clock from the Atari and used that to control the tape drive. We had to sacrifice one of the eight tracks on the reel-to-reel -to, -reel to be an SMPTE signal, but it was pucker and it worked most of the time. I'm going to play you now a little bit of a guitar solo recorded using that setup. As you'll hear, there's a bit of a glitch in the middle, and that glitch became the bane of my life, because every time we would master down to two-track, the songs that we had recorded, we always had to be on our guard against the glitch. And if we thought we'd heard it, we had to repeat the process in the hope that next time round, the MIDI and the audio would stay in sync. I hope you can see it wasn't perfect and that was one glitch we could never get rid of. In the next video I'm going to start talking about the workflow that we had, looking at how it was set up in Cubase, um, and although I don't have Cubase for the Atari anymore, I don't have the Atari anymore, I'll be showing you how I've managed to transfer some of that from one platform to another, with mixed results. So until then, you take care of yourselves.